dear dean, professors, colleagues, and students, it's a real pleasure for, for me to be here today to present this international seminar on, uh, sorry, <laughs> on cognition and culture in an evolutionary context, uh, co-organized co by the Faculty of Psychology and the Spanish Journal of Psychology. As probably most of you know, uh, since 1998, the faculty commit itself to have a very good uh, academic journal in English, and since uh, 2007 is in the journal citation report. In 2012, an agreement was signed with the Cambridge um, University Press, and now the journal is in the Q3 of the ranking. <coughs> This together with the event that we uh, that gathers us all together here is uh, a very good thing of uh, a fruitful collaboration. I'm truly impressed with the group of experts sitting in this room, and this is a brilliant exponent of the research that are doing our colleagues of the Faculty of Psychology in Neuroscience fields as well as in other fields. It's an honor and a privilege to have them uh, sit with us, and I really thank them, and also professors Colmenares and Hernandez Lloreda uh, for the effort they made to bring them here. I'm sure that these two days of meeting and discussion will bring all the attendants the chance to examine the origin of human culture from an evolutionary and development perspective and also to address the controversial issues of whether uh, non-human animals have culture or not. It's been such an exciting topic, and the reason why we are here today, I give the word to the psychology faculty deans, not without first thanking her for all the work that has been done to uh, make possible this f discussion forum in the Complutense University of Madrid. Buenos días, bienvenidos a este seminario internacional Cognition and Culture in Evolutionary Context. Eh, no se puede dar la bienvenida a quien viene a su propia casa, pero estamos muy agradecidos, muy agradecidos de que nuestra vicerrectora Pilar Arroz de Tejada eh, haya asistido a esta inauguración y es una presencia que de alguna forma eh, enfatiza el interés de los temas que vamos a tratar y sobre todo la relevancia de sus ponentes. Sí que quiero darles la bienvenida a todos, pero especialmente a los profesores y alumnos de otras facultades que se han eh, desplazado hasta aquí y a los que estamos encantados de, eh, de saludar. Eh, vienen eh, profesores y alumnos de la Universidad Politécnica de Madrid, de la Universidad de Castilla y la Mancha, la Universidad Autónoma de Madrid, del CEU, de la UNED de la Universidad Alfonso X, la Universidad de Brija, la Universidad Politécnica de Valencia, el Instituto de Salud Carlos III y de nuestros propios centros adscritos de la UCM, también viene del Centro Villanueva y del Cardenal Cisneros. Es muy probable que no estén todos aquí porque estas horas son horas de tráfico que a veces impiden llegar a tiempo. Quiero aprovechar también para saludar al decano del Colegio Oficial de Psicólogos, el profesor Fernando Chacón, que está siempre dispuesto a secundar nuestras iniciativas y hacernos algo menos difícil los asuntos de la financiación. Profesor Tomasello, profesor Whiten, profesor Boyd, profesor Van Schaik, profesor Leland, welcome to the Faculty of Psychology of the Universidad Complutense de Madrid. Certainly, you know, our university is very old, is very big, but as a public university, it's also modest in its resources. So we want to let you know how much we appreciate your generosity of spending your time and sharing your work with us. Thank you very much. We hope, we really do, you feel from now our faculty as yours. I should have a word of thanks to my dear colleague, Professor Javier Vandres, who leads the Spanish Journal of Psychology and who took the initiative to organize this international seminar with the priceless assistance of Ana Montero. And of course, I should mention the 
fruitful and enthusiastic work done by our dear colleagues, professors Fernando Colmenares and Maria Victoria Hernández de Oreda. Without all of them, this meeting wouldn't have taken place. Well, I'm sure we are going to learn a lot and to enjoy as well. Y que las palabras, las sinceras y debidas palabras de agradecimiento no nos resten muchos minutos del tiempo que disponemos para abordar los apasionantes temas que tenemos por delante. Así que muchas gracias a todos y de todo, a todos de nuevo bienvenidos. Ahora cedo la palabra al profesor Javier Vandrés, director de la revista Spanish Journal of Psychology. Thank you. Uh, just a few words to give you our warmest welcome to the Universidad, Universidad Complutense. The Spanish Journal of Psychology is deeply honored for having you in the advanced international seminar on cognition and culture in evolutionary context. Uh, the subject of the natural history of human thinking has been central in Spanish science for more than four centuries now. And it is not surprising since the discovery of the new world by the Spanish crown opened up a whole new set of questions on the relationship among natives, animals, and Europeans. One of the first questions the Spanish scholars had to answer was, are natives human beings, or are they just a kind of highly developed animal? And this question had a very important practical implication since slavery was already illegal in 16th century Spain. The Spanish crown scholars soon sentenced that natives were humans and they could not be used as slaves. Although this had the unfortunate side effect of promoting black slave trading from Africa. These days I had been, I remember a paper uh, Professor Javier Campos, who is here today, uh, Professor Rafael Llamona and I wrote on behavioral observation in America, the Spanish pioneers in the 16th and 17th centuries. Don't panic, I am not reading the paper. No. Uh, but I just want uh, to remember a quote from Bernabe Cobo, a Jesuit uh, who in 1642 uh, finished his natural history of the new world. He wrote, uh, discussing the mind of the monkeys in the new world, he wrote, the Indians call them the biggest of them all sacharunas, which means wild and sylvan men. The Indians believe that the only reason they don't speak is that they do not wish to pay taxes. Tax cheating. I wonder if tax cheating has received the attention it deserves as a factor in the evolution of the human mind. Uh, I, I'm sure these and much more substantial questions will be answered in this seminar, and I just want to welcome you again to Madrid and our school. Thank you. Y ahora el, los profesores Colmenares eh, harán la, y Mariví Hernández Lloreda harán la presentación de los profesores.
hear me? But you cannot hear me through the microphone. It makes things more challenging. Hello? Yeah. Uh, thanks. Um, <clears throat> can I have this? Okay, good morning and welcome everyone to this first advanced international summer, uh, sorry, seminar on cognition culture and in evolutionary context. Um, well, you know that my name is Fernando Colmenares and Maria Victoria Nade Lloreda. We are responsible for <coughs> inviting the uh, speakers and um, we have also, we will chair the sessions that we will have over this one day and a half uh, meeting. Um, so the first thing I want, I want to say is that we wholeheartedly thank the speakers for coming, for accepting to be involved in this project and for making room in their very busy agendas and to come to Madrid and to share altruistically rather than m mutualistically their knowledge with us. So, as you can see, the screen is black. Uh, it should be uh, some much nicer image over there. Um, <coughs> So I would like to stress that the five speakers are among the top, top ten leaders in the field. And science, I would say, is what scientists do. And science progresses when scientists work hard and make the results of their work visible by publishing it in the best scientific journals. And when they spend time training and teaching uh, pre-doctoral and doctoral students. And, um, okay, I'm here. Um, so I, I, I would like to say that this is a very good exa example of um, cultural inheritance, the experience that we are gonna have here. Um, I would also say that um, science is the outcome of creative minds working collectively, and it is disseminated through all the three modes of inheritance. So, horizontally, obliquely, and vertically. Importantly, an indicator of how much a scientist has potentially contributed to push forward a field of science is the number of intellectual offspring or descendants they, they produce and the number of citations of their work. And the panel of distinguished uh, speakers that will deliver the forthcoming lectures excel in all of these respects. Uh, they have been highly prolific in, in teaching, training, pre-doctoral and postdoctoral students who are now um, qualified researchers and established lecturers in very important universities in the US and in, in Europe. And they have very high scores of high impacted papers. Um, <coughs> of the, and, sorry. And they have very high, as I said, they have uh, a lot of books, as we will mention when we introduce each of them individually. And the impact of their publications in the field is outstanding as indicated by the number of citations they have accumulated. They regularly published in the top impact scientific journals, Science, Nature, PNAS, Proceedings, and so on. And their, book, their books have been published by the best academic presses, Harvard University Press, Cambridge University Press, Oxford University Press, Princeton University Press, and so on. Um, <coughs> they have been, many of these books have been translated into many other languages other than, than English. And some of these books also have received uh, awards. 
So they have all made massive and key contributions to uh, the field. And actually, many would say that they have uh, shaped the field the way it looks today. Okay. Now, I'm sorry we don't have any, yeah, no, okay. So, <coughs> although the study of culture itself is not our group field of expertise, we are running some ongoing research pro projects on cooperation in primates and non-human primates, and also in, on imitation in marine mammals. On the other hand, culture, cognition, and e eco Evo Devo um, are all topics that I and some of my colleagues cover when we teach um, our undergrads foundations of psychobiology. Before we, we listen to the lectures that our invited speakers will deliver, we thought that it would be helpful to start off by spending a few minutes introducing the seminar's topic. The goal of the short introduction um, <coughs> that follows is to provide some background information on the issues that will be covered in the uh, speaker's lectures. Of course, we hope you enjoy this seminar and find it a learning experience worth spending your time on. Okay, now things are getting complicated. Uh, because I now um, would need to have so what's the problem what's the the, the major topic that we set out to address? in this seminar, and the, um, the picture that will come out soon <laughs> will, will show, I think it captures very well, very nicely, the problem. We are gonna, we're gonna see, um, we're gonna see two young primates, a um, chimpanzee and a human, uh, they, they are using tools. So the chimpanzee, well actually this is the picture that uh, is in the, in, the, uh, in the poster announcing the seminar. So uh, you might remember it. Um, so the chimpanzee is using a stick I mean, this is a bit of fantasy, but uh, it's using a, a stick to uh, clean his nose. And the, obviously he's unaware that he's being watched. And the human baby is um, using a tool as well. He's using an iPad to watch her cousin primate um, using a tool. Obviously she's unaware that it has taken many generations to produce that, uh, that tool. Um, so the point is, I mean that's the empirical problem and what we are, um, what we will do is to inquire and to explore what are the developmental and evolutionary processes that underlie um, cultural behavior. I mean, in this particular case of tool using, they are supposed to represent a kind of, a, a type of um, material using a behavior which is um, supposed to be functional and that um, uh, represents one of the categories of, of uh, culture, which is uh, uh, material, material culture. And so we want to see 
to what extent different species use um, comparable behaviors to solve a particular task, and to what extent those behaviors, those, um, in this case, things that can be observable from outside are actually uh, based on the same cognitive mechanisms. And so this is one of the major challenges in this area, which is to what extent uh, comparable behaviors are actually based on processes that might be analogs or homologs. Um, so, culture. Uh, in brief, I would say that culture is about uh, behavior, about uh, symbols, about um, norms, about um, Right, okay. mm -hmm. So, um, one way of defining culture is uh, to say that uh, culture is about the way we do things, the way we play music, the way we write literature, the way we dance, and, and, and so on. And, and the way, of, of course, we, the way we behave in different contexts. It is about ethics, morality, norms, and of course it also includes language, as science, religion, politics, technology, and, and very importantly, social institutions. Um, so, we know that culture is sustained by cognitive mechanisms and by uh, brain structures. And something that we want to study is what is the nature of the relationship between um, observable behaviors, observable brain mechanisms, and an observable cognitive mechanisms that have to be inferred from uh, behavior. And so this interaction between, between those three levels of analysis are um, are important and sorry. Um, so here I give there. I give um, two working definitions of, of culture. I must say that th there are many in the field that there is not a um, consensus about which one is the best. And then I anticipate that uh, the speakers will have their own, probably they will have their own definitions. And um, as always, definitions tend to be tailored to the research or the field interest. Um, so the first definition that's um, I'm sorry
Eh, el ratón. El ratón. Ah, esto, esto. Ay, perdona, vale. Bueno, por suerte todos sabemos que la cultura tiene mucho más que ver con el pensamiento y la discusión que va a ocurrir a lo largo de este día y medio que con las herramientas eh, tan técnicas eh, a las que hemos llegado después de siglos de evolución y espero que a partir de ahora tengamos eh, un poco más de suerte con la técnica. Okay. Okay, so I mentioned already what's a, a major definition of, of culture. And then I mentioned that uh, we, are we are interested in understanding this relationship between those three um, levels of analysis. So how is culture interacting with um, the cognitive systems that sustain cultural behavior and how those cognitive systems actually uh, depend on brain functions and brain organization and then how the two of them um, contribute to the kind of observable behaviors, cultural behaviors that we, we see. Now, I mentioned that I was going to give a couple of definitions, this, uh, a broad definition in which um, we emphasize the fact uh, that information is learned or is inherited from others, um, that um, those behaviors tend to be group-specific, group-typical, uh, so there are intergroup differences in, in the behaviors, and then they tend to be stable across generations. And then we have the narrow, narrow definition in which uh, researchers get a bit demanding and then they restrict cultural uh, behavior um, if it is based on two high, highly demanding uh, forms of cognition, which is imitation and teaching. And, and also, they, also th they uh, claim that uh, the ratcheting effect, so the idea that um, uh, culture uh, is accumulated across generations and they produce this, um, um, this large amount of cultural behavior from one generation which is very different. And so this would be a caricature of what I'm saying. Obviously I'm, I'm, I'm pushing a bit uh, the, the, the distinction, but as you can see here, in each generation the amount of information that is accumulated and they have to be uh, process and have to be passed on to the uh, other individuals is very uh, is a very is a is a core feature of of culture in this definition in the narrow definition. Whereas in the other, what we see is that there are not very many differences across generations in the amount of information that is required to be to be learned. Uh, okay, so. This narrow definition emphasizes the fact that social learning can occur through many different vias. And what we see here is that there are three, I mean, there are many classifications. The taxonomies of uh, types of, so of social learning are really very abundant. And here we have one. So in the cognitively demanding version, of, I mean, categories of social learning, we have emulation, we have imitation, and have teaching. Um, so, with regard to imitation, this could be um, a way of approaching the problem of imitation. So, imagine that we are seeing someone uh, using, a t uh, using a particular behavior, actually pl uh, behavior plus a tool, which might be a key, and it's inserting the key inside a lock. Then, this is the, um, these are the behaviors that can be observed. And what we see is that is as a result, sorry, um, doing that 
produces a result. And the result is that the, the, the door is unlocked. So both are observable, and there is this, this causal relationship between uh, what we see in terms of behavior, and in this particular case, tool use, and the effect it has. And then, depending on the response of the individual when he's doing this particular behavior, we can infer what was the goal of the uh, individual. So if there is a match between the uh, inferred goal on the part of the individual and the result, then we actually will be testing and that actually that behavior was goal directed and it was obtained the, uh, result, the desired results. So if we bring this into the context of the study of imitation, the individual becomes a demonstrator. He may not know that he's been observed. And then we have the observer. This is a scheme, this is an approach that was um, um, proposed by Joseph Kahl and Malinda Carpenter. And so they wanted to see what were the sources of inf information that could be pro processed and taken into account in order to produce the different categories of um, social learning, um, sorry, of categories of, of imitation. And then what we, what we see is that the observer can see the behavior, can see the results, and may be sensitive to, may be able to understand and to perceive what are the, goal, the intended goals of the individual. And again, I want to emphasize that uh, individuals can, there, there, there are certain elements in this chain that can be directly observed, and then there's something that has to be inferred from those observations. And it seems that at least by, I mean, this is something that is changing uh, very rapidly in the field, but in 2011, um, some experts in this area would say that both chimpanzees and, and humans are able to, um, to process those three sources of information, but apparently there's a, s a slight difference between chimpanzees and, and humans in that humans pay more attention to the actual behaviors that are done than chimpanzees. And also that humans seem to do that more spontaneously and more naturally and more skillfully than uh, chimpanzees. So the second, um, I would say, high, um, highly complex forms of, of um, social learning is teaching. So here we have a definition uh, that could um, illustrate this, this um, process. In which what we see is that on the one hand, there is the instructor which scaffolds the pupil to, um, by providing information that uh, she doesn't know and, and to actively correct mistakes that uh, she could make on the one hand. Uh, on the other, this is also very important, pupils learn behavior but they also learn uh, things that are not tangible. They learn concepts, and they learn how to use them to actually create knowledge, if they like. Um, and in order to do that, it is very important, once more again, the underlying mechanism, which is uh, sustaining, sustaining this complex form of teaching, or this definition of teaching, is that um, they require complex cognitive mechanisms to do that. Whereas in the functional teaching, that, uh, sorry, in, in, the, in the functional definition of teaching, what we see is that we can circumvent all these problems by just looking at what the individuals do, what are the contexts in which they do. For example, do um, demonstrators direct, modify their behavior in the only in the presence of um, observers. So like they may take into account whether the observers are already experienced or unexperienced. And 
also in this functional definition, it is very important to, um, to mention that the instructor incurs some cost uh, or no immediate benefit, whereas the um, pupil gets information that otherwise would take maybe uh, weeks, months or years to pick. Now, obviously, the topic of the relationship between culture and intelligence is uh, very important and has been addressed by uh, many researchers in this area. And um, basically, the, the idea here is that every trait and every uh, ability, every cognitive skill is um, thought to be selected for in a given environment. So there are certain environments, certain niches that select for greater intelligence. Whether we consider that intelligence a domain a general um, capacity or a domain specific, what we see is that there should be a relationship between the demands that the individuals encounter in their niches and the uh, traits that they evolve in order to meet those demands, in order to adapt to those demands. And in this particular area, so there are, mm, I mean, there's this idea that maybe um, the complexity of the social environment, the social niche has promoted the evolution, the greater intelligence, and whether um, what um, happens is that those niches have um, selected for very specific, let's say, modular, modular kinds of intelligences. You see here, we see social intelligence, cultural intelligence, which means that those skills that are particularly helpful to maximize your fitness in those areas, in those uh, niches, will be promoted, will be fostered by natural selection. And something that also has been brought into this area is it and trying to understand the relationship between brain size and brain organization and the kinds of uh, skills that are uh, required to deal with different kinds of social or ecological uh, problems and demands. So I think that we will see here, because some of the experts in this area are uh, uh, going to speak uh, in this seminar, we will see that there are really very interesting correlations between um, social learning, uh, a social or individual learning, and, and different variables related to brain size and so on. So cooperation is a very important component of, of culture, not only in, in, in humans, but also in many other group living species. And this is a picture, this is a scheme, this is Hamilton's scheme, very famous one, uh, where we see the payoff matrix. So the effects of an individual's behavior on the actors, on the actors, sorry, and the uh, recipient of that behavior. And what we see here is that the, we, could, we could actually measure the impact on the individual's uh, welfare or on the individual's uh, fitness. And what we see here is that this impact can be positive, so could be fitness increasing or negative, fitness decreasing or welfare, whatever. And then what we see is this uh, arrangement, arrangement in which on this side we see those behaviors that benefit the recipient and they can be mutu mutualistic or altruistic here if the benefit that the recipient gets uh, is at a cost to the uh, actor. And on this side, what we see is uh, two categories of behaviors that initially are anything but cooperative. Um, they are competitive. One, this category is particularly interesting, I would say. It is called a spite in which both the recipient and the actor uh, incur a cost. And this has come by different names, like punishment, in which the 
um, the behavior actually can be exploitative, can be uh, a way to coerce some, uh, someone in the, in, in, the, in the group to be cooperative or to benefit the actor. Um, so that still sounds uh, rather competitive, not cooperative. But then we can break down this uh, category into two subcategories. One would be still a spite, but actually we could refer to this category uh, as uh, revenge or retaliation when you are actually being uh, nasty to someone who has been uncooperative to you. So you can sort of try to, um, to make someone um, modify their behavior so that you can get a benefit. And then we have this other category which turn green because now it is cooperative. So what we're seeing here is this third party punishment in which individuals act actually punish others that are uh, non-cooperative. Uh, non and this is a very important mechanism to um, enforce social norms and to um, prevent non-cooperators uh, to behave uh, in that way. So, revenge and altruistic punishment. Right, and there's another issue which is receiving attention recently, which is how, what is the, to what extent individuals, when they are engaged in social interactions, to what extent they take into account, on the one hand, what are the effects of their own behavior on others, if they care or not. Um, this is something which has to do with whether the behavior is um, self-regarding or other-regarding. And, and also, it is important, as you can see here, to understand whether they are really concerned and to what extent they can sort of connect with the feelings that others have and they can have those feelings can be aligned, which means that, for example, in this particular uh, situation, they um, are happy when others are happy. Or uh, another form of alignment of emotion is when you are sad, when others are sad. So that's empathy. And, but then we have these other two categories in which the feelings of the individual and uh, the uh, recipient are uh, misaligned, so we have this situation which you envy, you have envy or you are jealous at someone else's uh, fortunes, or you are happy when somebody else is sad. And this is tremendously important. I mean, these kind of emotions that uh, probably are underlying social action and cooperation are very important because, uh, as we will dis probably discuss, to, uh, tomorrow in the um, discussion session, uh, we will see that some of these emotions are actually very adaptive and very useful to um, understand what's going on within groups and how they contribute to enforce norms and so on. This is a particular example, by the way, of punishment, which is antisocial punishment. This antisocial punishment is uh, based, might be based on emotions that we might say that are negative, and, um, but they, contribute, they certainly contribute a lot to the way individuals organize within groups and the way norms are or not effective. So I'm gonna end by mentioning three, making three highlights. The first is that culture is both the product, is, 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 is both a product and producer of, I would say, co-evolves with sociality, competition, cooperation, brain size and organization, and especially socio-cognitive skill. So what I want to say is that every thing, every adaptation that evolves in any of these areas has an influence, an influence on the others and all of them um, co-evolve, as we will see in many of the, uh, some of the talks that uh, will follow. And this picture 
of co-evolving uh, different um, mechanisms at the level of sociality or cooperation and so on are very important. The, um, I think they help us organize the information that we have to study and to understand that um, the relationship between all these um, ingredients of um, culture and of social organizations are uh, very uh, are key to understand any of the traits characteristics that define each of them so we couldn't understand what's what is driving the evolution of sociality or the evolution of brain or the evolution of culture if we don't have this picture of interrelationships between all of them the second is that is that culture is adaptive but actually culture can be maladaptive as well so what I'm saying is that culture has an impact on the individual's short-term welfare, but also on their fitness. So obviously it depends on the context in which those different, uh, the variation in, in cultural variation can have different uh, effects on individuals within groups. And the third highlight has to do with the role of history. I think that developmental psychologists and and developmental biologists are very, very much aware of uh, the importance of, of um, history. So, on the one hand, we have that <coughs> culture <coughs> develops over the, of, over the individual's lifetime. So it's not something that is sprung into being from the beginning, so it has to, you have to interact with your environment, you have to interact with the um, um, culture you are exposed to in order to develop yourself, your uh, cultural behavior. Um, on the other hand, culture is inherited from your ancestor, I mean your uh, close ancestors within your own lineage. And so we, we learn from, us, from members of previous generations. And, and also very important is that there's a, a legacy which means that there are many of the traits, many of the brain structures, many of the way the brain organizes information, many of the ways that um, the cognitive skills develop and are used in a functional way, they are related to our distant, remote history as members of lineages. And a point that I'm going to make just to finish is that uh, something that we will discuss tomorrow very, very probably uh, maybe also today, is that the traits that we inherit from our uh, remote ancestors can be modified over the course of uh, our evolutionary history, which means that evolution um, makes individuals, sorry, species to share traits, but also make species unique. And then we have to understand that that both mechanisms, continuity and discontinuity, should be expected and actually occurs. Right. Um, so I, I, I hope this short introduction will have uh, given you some uh, concepts, some introduction of the uh, concepts that we are going to hear in this uh, series of lectures. But um, now, I'm just going to introduce the first speaker, um, Professor Mike Tomasello. And I want to say that he, he studied in psychology, sorry, so he studied psychology in Duke University and experimental psychology in, uh, sorry, in Georgia University. And he had, he held positions from 82, from 1980 to 1998 uh, as assistant, associate, and full professor in, in, Emory, in Emory University. And since 1998, he's co-director of the Maxman Institute. He's also co-director of the Wolfhorn Keller Primate Research Center. And he's, he's one of the, well, I believe that he's the managing director of the Maxman Institute. Um, his research focuses on 
processes of social cognition, social learning, and communication and language in human children and, and great apes. He has produced a lot of books. Uh, some of them have, it, have been translated into 13 languages. And <clears throat> I'm not going to uh, mention because you, have, you can actually check this information in the internet. He has received many, many uh, awards and international prizes for the books and, and obviously for his contributions to this field. I can mention the William James Book Award by the American Psychological Association, the Fison Foundation Prize for Cognitive Science, um, the Sid Frederick Bartlett Prize and Lectureship the United, in the United Kingdom, the Heineken Prize for Cognitive Science, Royal Academy of Netherlands, and the last one I have here is the Helmut Plessner Prize um, by the Helmut Plessner Society. Um, so thank you very much uh, for coming, uh, Mike. It's okay. Hello? Hola? <laughs> um, I spent uh, the summer in 1967 in Madrid, <laughs> before all of you were born. Uh, and uh, it's one of the great times of my early life, and I'm really happy to be back here. Um, the presupposition of all of us here that you'll be hearing today is that culture uh, is a product uh, of evolution. It's a way of adapting that cer certain species have uh, come to and other species perhaps not. <clears throat> um, and one of the major ways of investigating the evolutionary roots of 
culture in whatever species, in, in the human species, is by looking at culture in other species, which is what a number of the people uh, here have uh, done. And um, the dimension that has been focused on mostly is the, trans, uh, the, the dimension of cultural transmission. That is, um, in the biological way of looking at things, there's genetic transmission of information, and then there's this cultural transmission of information by social learning uh, and so forth. And the dimension that uh, I would like to focus on today is the more coordinative dimension. That is, things like collaboration, communication, and in the case of humans, social institutions, which are the way we coordinate ourselves together in a culture to create these supra-individual uh, structures like a collaborative group or a social institution, those are then transmitted across generations. Uh, so the two dimensions are uh, closely tied together. Uh, but the, um, uh, I'm going to focus on cooperation, coordination, communication, collaboration, all the co's, <laughs> the co-doing things together. Now the <clears throat> It can't go over the other machine. It can't go over the other machine. It has to stay here. I have videos and they're all over the place. But <clears throat> okay, I, and I would argue, I'm not going to make that argument today, but I would argue that in fact, if you look at human culture, what makes it unique is this coordinative dimension, the collaboration communication institutions, that in fact are going to lead to unique forms of transmission in humans. What Fernando referred to as teaching and um, uh, as, as uh, uh, um, the uh, culture, uh, ratchet effect and teaching and all of that, those are a result of this uh, unique coordinative, di coordinative dimension that humans have. Okay, the starting point is, uh, in talking about all this collaboration, communication, coordination, uh, the starting point is going to be the intelligent action of our nearest primate relatives, the mainly chimpanzees I'll focus on. And so this is an old study that we did some years ago, uh, looking at the social cognitive skills of great apes. And in this um, experiment, um, uh, this is, there's, here's a banana. If you put the banana right out here in the middle of the floor, uh, this is a subordinate chimpanzee here and a dominant chimpanzee here. And if you just let them in, the dominant chimpanzee would always get the banana. You say, how do I know that? Because that's how we define dominance. The one that always gets the banana is the dominant. And we've done a pretest to establish that. And so what you're going to see is um, uh, there's one banana here that they both can see, but there's one banana over here that only the subordinate chimpanzee can see. So it's kind of knowledge versus power. The dominant uh, knows about that one, and you'll see what the subordinate does is uh, the door will go down so he can't see what the dominant is doing, and he goes first, very carefully checks out and grabs the piece that the dominant can't see. The dominant comes and gets it and comes to check to make sure there's not some more over here that he, that he can't see. Um, it's important that uh, the subordinate's uh, door goes open first. The subordinate is not waiting to see what the dominant does and reacting. He's having to predict what the dominant's going to do, and he predicts the dominant will go for the food he can see and not for the food that he cannot see. So they understand others as having goals. The other guy wants the banana. That's why he's going to come. And he has um, uh, perceptions. He can see the banana of getting the banana, he wouldn't be going for it. If he couldn't see it, he wouldn't be going for it. So they understand that the behavior of others 
is driven by their goals and perceptions. So this is a basic understanding of how intentional action works, that you pursue your goals and you monitor them by perceiving the world. But it turns out, um, the hypothesis that we've been um, uh, investigating for some time, it turns out that chimps, chimpanzees do this most often in competition with one another. So I at one time thought that if you understood others as intentional agents, then you would automatically want to cooperate with them and communicate with them and share with them. But that's not the case. You can figure out others uh, for purposes of outsmarting them in competition. And we think that's what chimps mainly do. And what humans are mainly doing is using that kind of mind reading, that social cognitive skills, to now share intentions with them. So the distinction that we've made, um, we borrowed this from some philosophers of action who talk about shared intentionality, is that chimps are incredibly intelligent, more intelligent than we would ever have imagined a couple of decades ago, at acting intentionally themselves, but also understanding others as acting intentionally, but it's all individual intentionality. They're acting for themselves, for their own goal, trying to outsmart others and compete and exploit others as far as they can. What happened with humans was, given individuals who already had a lot of smarts in this area, it can, you can't just start cooperating anywhere and create this, it's when you have already intelligent beings, and now humans have what we call shared intentionality. We act collaboratively with a joint goal. We work together toward a joint goal. Um, we have shared attention. We both know that we're both focused on this and we're monitoring one another. So we're sharing goals, we're sharing intentions, uh, and so we create this triangle of we're both going toward the same goal and we're, we know about one another that we have the same goal and we're doing it uh, together. So this is our most general hypothesis about the difference between our nearest primate relatives, especially chimpanzees and humans, about what makes for the difference in the ways that we coordinate, communicate, and collaborate with one another, that we have a new set of cognitive skills that have evolved in the last uh, six million years uh, f uh, for sure, but probably the last uh, million years or so. Um, and uh, and uh, these enable us to interact with others in unique ways and also to pass along information, teaching and everything else um, as well. Now, in some more recent theoretical work, we've actually divided shared intentionality, if we think about human evolution, into two key steps. One of them is joint intentionality, which is a between individuals. So you and I collaborate to get something done. We hunt together for an antelope or whatever it is we do. We have joint action, whoops, um, joint action. We form a joint agency. Some of the philosophers talk about we have a joint agent. We are, we are a single agent with two individuals. We have joint attention, common ground, joint commitment to one another. It's all second personal. It's about you and me working together, all right, as individuals. But then later, and this is the focus I believe will be the focus of the other talk this morning, uh, Rob Boyd, <laughs> uh, we, we've done a lot of talks together, uh, is collective intentionality or culture proper, which is the topic of our seminar here. This is about things that are not about you and me as individuals. This is about things you and I are both born into as members of our culture. Conventions, norms, institutions, cultural common ground. You and I have never met, but there are certain things that I'm sure we all know together as, a, as a part, being part of Western culture in general. Normative self-governance. We, we, uh, we follow moral rules, and not only that, but we, don't, we expect others to follow them. We think badly of others who don't follow them. We think badly of ourselves and feel guilty if we don't follow them. All of these things are about our cultural expectancies and our life in a group. This is about individual relationships. This is about life in a group. Okay. Now, um, Rob Boyd, who will talk after me, I will focus on this, on this level, and uh, th uh, this is the level that really gets us to uniquely human culture. But I've argued before, and I will argue again here, that this is the thing that you can already see differences between humans and non-human primates, chimpanzees, even in young children. So in young children who are not yet fully cultural beings, they don't have all the moral norms, they don't really know a lot about institutions, the, that kind of thing, they're already cooperative in unique ways. So I'm going to focus on, I'm going to say just a little bit at the end about this, but I'm going to mainly focus on uh, the ways that humans cooperate, collaborate with one another, and the vehicle for this is experiments between chimpanzees, mostly, and young human children. 
So we're going to take chimpanzees and children, we're going to put them in very similar experimental situations. Now, you'll hear a lot, from, especially from Andy Whiten and Carl von Scheich and Kevin Leyland, you'll hear a lot about the continuities in cultural processes between non-human primates and even other animals uh, and human culture. And those are all true. <laughs> but the humans also have some special things, uh, and these special things are what I'm going to focus on. Um, and we do that in these experiments. This is just um, a very brief uh, uh, re reference to an evolutionary fairy tale. The evolutionary fairy tale is that humans, uh, maybe some between uh, a million and a half a million years ago, gradually start uh, engaging in collaborative foraging, collaborative hunting, collaborative foraging for resources. Um, and, uh, and it becomes obligate. That is to say, if you were not a good collaborator, you couldn't get any food anymore. Getting food by yourself, uh, other monkeys and baboons and stuff were stealing all the food before humans could get them. The, only, the new niche for them was to collaborate, to go hunt together and get an antelope or gather tubers together as these women are doing here. Um, and so uh, if you weren't a good collaborator, you died. Okay, that was all there was to it. So, uh, and now you, go you and I go collaborating sometime to kill an antelope. We kill the antelope, I eat it all and chase you away, well, next time you're not going to choose me as a partner. So if you were a bad collaborator, nobody wanted you as a partner. And so you were out. And so that's the selection pressure that led to this cooperation among individuals, is social selection for good cooperators. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through two sets of experiments. One motivational, one focusing on motivation, the other focusing on cognition for ways that human children are already adapted for this special form of collaboration in a way that great apes are not. The differences are really subtle. Great apes collaborate, great apes communicate. But uh, that's why we need these comparative experiments because you need to put them in exactly the same situation or the situation as close to exactly the same as possible and see if some subtle differences emerge. And that's what um, our whole research program is about. So I'm going to just briefly talk about the motivation to collaborate, the motivation to share the spoils of the collaboration, which is key, uh, and the motivation to exclude free riders. All of these are key um, uh, criteria that enable the evolution of cooperation in some new ways. So here's a very, very simple experiment. Uh, um, the chimp comes in, and this is done with children and chimps, uh, but sometimes I show chimps and sometimes I show children, but almost all of them are comparative. Uh, th so that's the, um, um, uh, uh, anyway, the, so the subject comes in, and there are two boards with food on them here. You're actually going to see a video of how the board works in a minute, but I'm going to show this first. The boards have exactly the same rewards on them. There's one banana for this guy and one banana for this guy. And the same here, one banana for this guy, one banana for this guy. And the subject's choice is, do I want to pull in this board collaboratively with this guy, or do I want to pull in this board by myself? The rewards are exactly the same, both for me and the other guy. So the motivational side from the food point of view is absolutely the same. But what do I choose? Chimps are indifferent. They slightly go more for the, uh, for the individual option, but basically since the food is the same, they go the same. Kids are almost 80%. They prefer to collaborate. Well, why? Well, collaboration is fun. <laughs> they like it. <laughs> they prefer it. That's all there is to it. So that's why I said this was very simple. It's a very simple experiment. Which do you prefer? And children prefer um, to collaborate. And the chimps are indifferent unless, sorry, anybody who knows anything about chimps knows how to make them go one way or the other. All you have to do is double, sorry, is uh, Double the food over here, and now <laughs> they prefer the collaborative one. So if you, if you double the food uh, on the collaborative option, you can get them to go for it. So this shows you they're going for the food, uh, and the kids are motivated by the collaboration per se. It doesn't say that chimps don't collaborate. They collaborate. Ha almost half the time they collaborate. But this is a difference in uh, motivation. <clears throat> now, one of the keys... I think this is, in some ways, this is absolutely the key of why chimps uh, don't collaborate like humans do, is that chimps are evolved to, when there's a contest over food, the dominant gets the food. This is very general in, mammal in mammals in general, and with uh, all the great apes, and with chimps um, 
including bonobos, uh, uh, and with chimps in particular. They're evolved to get to, uh, sh to, for the dominant to get the food. So here's an experiment. This is, the, this is the, the board, the pulling in the board that I showed you before. You have to do it together. The rope is, is through here, so if you pull by yourself, you just get rope. You have to wait for the other guy, and then you have to pull together. And what we've done here, is, and so here you'll see this. Um, here comes the guy. He knows he needs the partner, so he comes to his rope. He knows if he pulls it, it's bad, so he goes and actually opens the door for his partner. This is incredible on its own. They know they need the partner, so this is really impressive that they can do it together. They know they need the partner. They go fetch the partner. But the trick is we've divided the food for them already. Okay? The, the problem of sharing the spoils has been solved. Now we put the food in the middle. They have to figure out a way to share it. He does the same thing. He opens the door for his partner. The food's in the middle. He's unenthusiastic because she knows what's coming. This is normal chimp behavior. This is not something weird. This is what chimps do. The dominant gets the food. Okay? And it doesn't matter whether you pulled or didn't pull. And so what happens is on the next trial, the subordinate stops. There's nothing in it for me. What's the point? Right? So collaboration breaks down because you can't share the spoils equitably. Now, look at young children. Generally the same situation, obviously slightly different. Uh, that can be discussed as in methodological issues. But roughly the same situation. Here they come. This is four gummy bears in the middle. They're only in the middle this time. You're only going to see the one where it's in the middle. And they're going to pull together. They each have their own little bowl here. I'm showing you this one because the boy on the right is going to act like the dominant chimp. <laughs> He's going to come over immediately. This little boy is slow. But he doesn't take all four. He doesn't take all four. He actually only has one right now. This guy is saying there's none over here. He comes over. He starts to take all the rest. The other kid says, no! <laughs> okay. And they end up with two each. And in fact, they end up with two each almost every time. Okay, and now, okay, all right, and they can do this as long as you want, okay, they trust, they, they build up, they know the other one is not going to take more than their share, they just keep going, and now here's what happens when one does take more than their share, um, these are two little girls, and they're going to pull too hard, these kids are three years old, by the way, they're, they're going to pull too hard, and they're going to go down on the rug, and this little girl takes more, And she protests, and the other girl puts it back, so now they have two and two, all right? So if the other one tries to be greedy, she protests, and the other one relents. So in this kind of situation, in this study, um, this is, now this is really important, okay? The child, uh, the children never protest if, the, if it's two and two. If the protest is, I want more, I want more, then I should protest if you take any. If you take one or two, I'm going to say, what are you doing? I want them all. That's not what they do. If it's two and two, they don't protest. They're happy. They only protest if the other guy takes more than two. And then they protest, and the other one almost always relents and gives it up. And they, why do they give it up? Because they know they're wrong. <laughs> they know they shouldn't be doing that. So they say, oh, okay. All right? That's it. All right? It's not, if, 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 it was, um, if they already have two and two, and the other one protested, which they don't, but if they did, they wouldn't give it up. They wouldn't give it up because they know two and two is okay. You have no basis for your protest. So they're understanding the logic behind dividing the spoils in an equal way. Now, here we, we really push this to the hilt. Is Here's an experiment where uh, the kids are... We did the chimps in this also, and I'm not going to talk about that, but the chimps did not do this same thing. Uh, so what they're going to do is they're going to pull together here. They're pulling collaboratively, and we wanted to make life difficult for them, and so you'll see what happens. Whoops! <laughs> three to one side, one to the other. Now what do they do? The one with three has a, if you, I'll use the uh, economics language, an aversion to advantageous inequity. <laughs> Uh, okay, they are costly sharing, they are giving up one, and they are giving up one because we pull together, we should have an equal share. So they do this 80% of the time. 80% of the time, they give up one. Research on three-year-old children has consistently shown three-year-old children are selfish. You give them a bunch of stuff, you say, share some with your friend. 
share whatever you want. And then they'll give one, you know, they, just minimum. That's because they already have it in their possession. Here's a situation where uh, nobody owns it. It's out in the open. This would be like collaborative hunting. Nobody owns it. It's already out there. We produce it together, and now we share. So we had a control condition where they come in, and it's already divided three to one. We actually had another control condition where they pulled and they produced the three and the one separately. And when they do that, they almost never share. So indeed, they are selfish with stuff they already own. But this situation of collaboration promotes fair sharing. So we think this is evidence, or at least consistent with the hypothesis, that collaboration generates a sense of equal sharing in humans naturally, and it doesn't in chimps. So chimps don't voluntarily share that much. We, create, we constructed a, a situation where they could protect their three or let the other guy reach over and grab their three, and they didn't care one way or the other. Whether they produced it together or didn't produce it, it was the same. Right? So there was no... Um, difference between collaboration and non-collaboration in the chimps. Okay, so this is the sharing of the spoils. You can't get collaboration going if everybody's not incentivized, if everybody's not motivated, and if one guy's hogging all the spoils, you're never going to get motivated. So to get collaboration going in humans, you need some kind of tolerance and understanding of um, doing it together. Now, uh, another critically important aspect of this sharing of the spoils is excluding free riders. Uh, Rob and others have done all kinds of models of the evolution of cooperation where the, the basic premise uh, in all of them is you can't have free riders because they undermine the whole system. So you can't have people that wait for you and I to do all the work and we work for an hour hunting an antelope or five hours hunting an antelope and killing it and they come up and say, oh, I'll have my share now. All right, that doesn't work. It undermines the whole system. So um, we had an experiment where this was done with children and chimpanzees. I'm showing you the chimpanzee version here. And um, it's a two-by-two two experimental design. And I, I just focus on the key thing, which is that um, either this guy helped to pull or not, all the rewards are coming to one guy. And the question is, is he going to share them? If he helped to pull then he should really share some with him because he helped produce them. All right? uh, or if he didn't pull, and actually when he didn't pull, it was because this guy had both ropes and he could pull it in together. If he didn't pull, then there's no reason to share with him. He's a free rider. Right? And what we found was that the, ch the chimps don't care whether the other guy pulled or not. Uh, they share with him a little bit or not so much. It depends. We made this actually... Uh, so they couldn't really monopolize it. It was this big uh, mango or something like that. Or, so, uh, any case. And with children, um, with children, um, we actually had to, we had to ramp it up a little bit. So let me be honest with you. The first thing we tried, they didn't exclude free riders very well. But then we had the, the kid come in together and say, no, I don't want to do that. No, no, I'm going to play something else instead. And now the guy produces it by himself, and he comes over and he says, now I'd like some, and they don't share with him. So they exclude free riders if they kind of announce their, uh, their, their intention to not participate. Uh, so um, what we have is children more motivated to collaborate, better able to share the spoils in a fair way that keeps everybody motivated, and excluding free riders. So these are three things that stabilize dyadic two-person cooperation in young children that chimps don't do. Okay, now let's talk just a little bit about the cognitive side of things. So cognitive adaptations that humans might have, human children might have already for collaboration uh, and communication. I've written a whole book on communication, human-like communication evolving in the context of collaborative activities to help coordinate collaborative activities. Joint goal and joint commitment, individual roles in these uh, um, uh, collaborative activities. A key thing is that we have a joint goal, but we each have our own role, right? You're going to do X, I'm going to do Y, both toward this joint goal. We have individual roles. Cooperative communication to, uh, to um, uh, coordinate this activity. And this is where I said I'm going to mention the cultural level. I'm going to mention here also social norms at the end that stabilize the cooperation as well. And this is, again... Shared or shared intentionality sometimes calls we intentionality. We are going to do this. <clears throat> okay, so here's a little um, coordination. Uh, kids, and we have chimps in the same thing. But um, 
they just have to coordinate uh, on one of these uh, tubes. And this is an 18-month-old child. And you see he's coordinating quite well. He's going to tease him, okay? He starts to put it in the other one, but see, he's kind of got a play face, and then he comes back to the other one. Now the experiment is that the human is now going to go blank. He's going to quit cooperating. Now what does the child do when he quits cooperating? He says, come over, play your part. What are you doing? Come, come, come. Okay, come do your part. He's got his hand stuck in the tube. <laughs> now he extracts it and says, come, 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 do your part. All right, so now he comes back again. So he's programmed, experimented, he's programmed for 15 seconds not to do anything, and the children almost always do some form of communication, beckoning, pointing, something to get the other guy to re-engage in the collaborative activity. Um, now with chimps, this is a different, um, this is a different experiment. I, I didn't show the other apparatus, the one with the tubes, because what the chimps preferred to do is they would put the toy in the tube and then they'd run around to the other end to catch it. So they actually preferred making an individual game. But uh, here's one where we made it where they had to cooperate. So cooperating here with a human. Uh, this is basically, there's some food in here and she has to lift the door and then the human can reach in and get it. And you'll see, and the point is, the human fairly early in this sequence is going to go blank so now she stopped interacting. She's not reaching. So this is Annette, a human raised chimp. Not very happy. <laughs> and now just coming around and basically trying to get it herself. So she's saying, this guy stopped. I don't know what to do, but I'll just try to get it myself. She's trying to get it herself. Now the 15 seconds is over. She's signaling she's ready. She's signaling she's ready. And indeed they succeed. Okay? But notice... When the other one stops interacting, she doesn't say, what are you doing? Why, play your part. Why aren't you doing your thing? She just says, well, stuff happens, you know, and then I'm going to go and try to do it myself. So they try to solve it by themselves. They don't try to re-engage the partner. So we, th we have used this as one piece of evidence about the notion of a joint goal. The child has the idea, we are doing this. We are playing this game. Why did you stop? We're doing it. The chimps don't have the idea of we're doing it. They have the idea of you're doing that, I'm doing this, and it works out. Now, some people have asked me, they said, well, look, the kid's up, you know, collaborating with someone of his own species. There's a chimp collaborating with a human. Well, we actually had two human race chimps doing this, and every once in a while, they would be successful. But guess what happened? You noticed here, the human got it and shared it. <laughs> the one who got it didn't share it. So then nobody would pull the thing up anymore. So the, the failure to share the spoils, again, uh, 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 um, uh, shows its face here. Um, now, the idea of a joint commitment. This is a little bit more. This is ratcheting up just a little bit from joint goal. A joint commitment uh, the philosopher Margaret Gilbert has a wonderful paper called On Taking a Walk Together. The idea is I say to you, uh, let's go have a cup of coffee. Let's go get a cup of coffee in the cafe, okay? And we start walking to the cafe to get a cup of coffee, and I just walk off. We said we were going to get a cup of coffee. How can, you just can't walk off, right? Now, of course, I can walk off if I say, oh, I'm sorry, I just remembered something. Okay, I got to go do something. And then you say, okay, so you allow me to break the commitment, and then I can do it. But if I don't ask your permission to break the commitment, then we have a commitment. And that means following through until we reach the goal that we're going for. So what we did here was um, these kids come in and um, these are, this is a stick with two um, uh, buckets, two bowls on it, and they have rewards in them. But we've rigged it so that this little girl is going to get her reward first. Her hole over here is blocked. And you'll see what happens. So... <coughs> So I actually, when I see this, I see early humans, I have to tell you. I see early humans here trying to work out a collaborative arrangement. And they finally get it up. She gets her reward. She has to go over here to cash it in, but she's not going to cash it in. The other girl asks for help. She sees this, and now she sees the problem. She didn't know it at first. And now they push it on up. And now they go over and cash it in, see? That, that's, that's, the, that's our reward for them. They get to put in this little thing. Uh, now, importantly, we had a control condition here where um, the, board with the, the, the stick with the bowl started right here. So they just came in the room, and this girl just reached hers with no collaboration. 
Now the other girl asks for help. They help her sometimes. But helps her almost twice as much if it's in the middle of a collaboration rather than just pure help. So again, the collaboration somehow structures helping your partner. Now that makes sense, right? We're doing it together. I need you. If, you don't, if, you, if you're unsuccessful, we're not going to be successful together. So I need to help you. In this case, we had the special condition where she got her reward first and she actually doesn't need her anymore for her own reward, but still, we had a commitment. So we finish on through to the end. Uh, chimps uh, don't do this. So anybody who's worked with chimps knows we have them doing that pulling in thing. We, we, we changed it a little bit so it was on a side thing. Uh, they pull it in, the chimp gets hers, game over. Okay, tough luck <laughs> for the partner, but I got out of it what I wanted out of it. I got the food out of it. And so that's the end of it. We, we sometimes talk about the chimp version of this kind of co collaboration as social tool. They're using each other as social tools, which is quite clever, okay, quite clever, but it's not the same motivation as a joint commitment where I, we said we were going to do it together, and so we're going to finish it through till the end. <clears throat> uh, here, I, now, I will have to tell you that explicit joint commitments where you say them out loud, you make a joint commitment out loud, is not normal in children. They don't do it very often. All right. Uh, so here is a case where I actually captured one on film, so I'm going to show it to you. This is a little, um, uh, we had chimps in this one too. Uh, well you can see the uh, slide over there. But the, the task is this. We pull together to this side and only I get a reward. But if we pull together to this side, only you get a reward. So the solution, the natural solution, is to take turns. The natural solution is we pull to your side, then we pull to my side. But where do we go first? <laughs> okay, that's a little bit of a problem. And so these are five-year-olds, so they're a little bit older. Uh, and I'm going to preview it for you because it goes very quickly. You may have trouble hearing it. Um, what they're going to be saying is this kid's going to say, they say, no, here. And the other one says, no, here. And no, here. No, here. And then this one stops and says, but then here, Okay. And the other kid says, okay. So you'll, you'll see that. So they have a joint commitment that, okay, I'm going to pull to your side, but that means next one we're pulling back to my side. <laughs> okay, and so now they work it out. Okay? Now, when you have a joint commitment like that and you don't hold your end up, if this guy took his prize and ran away, whoa, okay, that's going to be bad news for his reputation, all right? And, and nobody's going to want to collaborate with him again. So you make a joint commitment. It's out in the public uh, that, we've, that we've made this commitment, and it means you have to follow through or suffer serious consequences. Uh, so you can see here, these are three- and five-year-old children's pooled together. About 60% of them learn to take turns. One of the really interesting things is that some of the children took a while to figure out the turn-taking strategy. So it took them half or three-quarters of the experiment. Once they got the turn-taking strategy, they never went back. They always stayed in the turn-taking. A couple of the chimps would one time go one side and one guy side go to the other side, and we got very excited and thinking, oh boy, they're going to... And then it'd just fall apart. So, so they, um, it wasn't really a strategy for them. It was something that they sort of stumbled into, but they couldn't maintain it. The kids always maintained it once they discovered it. Um, okay, now another sort of cognitive dimension of this <coughs> is, so, th so this is the goal side, the joint goal, the joint commitment. So this is something that humans do. They have a joint commitment. It has a normative force. We have to do it together once we've committed to it. And then there is the understanding of the roles involved. I'm going to just sort of let this run because this is one of my favorite films. I've been showing it for about 10 years now. Uh, this was actually a pilot subject for a helping study. And he puts, away the, um, he puts away the magazines, and then he's going to have a little trouble here. And the 18-month-old baby, and not only that, here's the key part for what I'm talking about today. He says, they go there. Okay? Right. And he's going to do it again and look to the face. They go there. So he's telling him how to play his role because he knows what the role is now. Now he knows what's going on. Now he knows what the task is. And now he's, um, Felix is going to do it again. Now the kid doesn't wait for him to have trouble. He actually opens it up before he even has the trouble. He knows it, and he knows what the other guy's supposed to do. They go there. Right? Right. So we have argued that from this incredibly early age, this, this kid is still in diapers. 
Okay, from this incredibly early age, this kid understands the collaborative activity. We've said from a bird's eye view. That is, he understands both of the roles and that you could play this role and I could play that role. Uh, we have experiments showing that, it, uh, that the kids can switch roles. Uh, and actually, here I'm going to show you an experiment where, that demonstrates this with, versus chimps and kids. This is chimps and kids again. Um, and here's the, here's, the, here's the final test. The final test is... How well do you play role B in this collaborative activity? How quickly do you learn it? How quickly are you skillful at role B? Now, what we manipulate is, in a baseline condition, you're just coming in cold. You have no experience in role B, so this is a baseline. How long does it take you to learn to play role B in a collaborative activity? The experimental condition, the participant condition, is you've already played role A. So you've been on the other side of the collaboration. You've never played role B before, but you've played role A. All right, and now the question is, does this help you? Is there value added once you've been on the other side of it? And uh, you probably by now have gotten the pattern of my studies, <laughs> the results of my studies, and know what the answer is going to be. Three-year-old children are better if they've played the opposite reciprocal role. They've learned something by monitoring the other guy. The chimps didn't learn anything. They learned the role the same, whether they'd been in role A or not. So, again, our hypothesis is that children understand the collaborative activity from a bird's eye view. They understand the two roles. The roles can be reversed. When they're cooperating with the other guy, they're monitoring what he's doing, trying to adjust to him, and the chimps are more in social tool mode. They're, they're doing something collaborative. They, 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 they can solve the task. They learn how to do it, but they're just not doing it the same way. So, we have actually, um, uh, I, I would, I, I'm not going to say, uh, especially not in the presence of Rob Boyd, I'm not going to say formalized it. We've depicted it in a picture uh, where we try to say, here's the essence of this adaptation that humans uh, have for collaborative activity that I've been showing you, um, is that we have things that we share that are joint. We have a joint goal. We have joint attention around what we're doing. And, but you have your role, and I have my role. And you have your perspective on the situation. We're jointly looking at this, okay? You and I are looking at it together, but I see this side and you see that side. So you have your perspective and I have my perspective. And indeed, um, we have argued that um, the whole notion of perspective, which is key to human cognition, what's key to human cognition is I can, I can call the same animal, a dog or an animal or a pet or a pest, I can call the same animal different things. Different, I can take different perspectives on it. Human language encodes these different perspectives on things. Um, and uh, we argue that it's only possible if you have this joint attention. We together are looking at something, but you're looking from this, uh, this way and I'm looking at it that way. And if you just look out one side of the ro room and I look out the other side, we don't have different, we just see completely different things. But if we look at the same thing, but from different perspectives, then that's got this j simultaneous sharedness and individuality. And it's a new kind of indiv individuality uh, that's, that's uh, created by this joint activity, complementary roles, complementary perspectives. And so this is the cognitive schema that leads humans down this road to having the flexible cognition that we do where we can see things in different ways for different purposes. Um, and so communication is a key part of this, and this is um, just a v the simplest experiment you can uh, imagine, which is that she's going to hide this toy. <coughs> she gets him interest. This is 12-month-old prelinguistic. Prelinguistic now. She's going to center him. She's going to hide the toy. He doesn't know where it is. She's going to center him to the middle. And now she's going to point and show him where it is. And sure enough, 12-month-old gets it. And you say, well, of course he gets it. She told him where it was. Well, it turns out we've been doing a lot of experiments in this kind of paradigm. And, you know, you can go up to some animal in the zoo and say, there, okay? And they won't just know that there's food there, okay? This, understanding this takes a certain uh, cognitive skills already. So, for example, when chimps are uh, given this, and this is not just one study, this is a whole series of studies, you point and the chimp chooses randomly, okay? So they don't know, and, and by, they don't always choose the opposite thinking you're trying to cheat them, uh, to trick them. It's, it's random, they choose randomly. Um, there are a couple of studies showing a couple of little things that I won't get into the nuances here, but uh, in any case, generally they're, they're very poor. 
young children are very good at 12 months prelinguistically, and by 18 months, uh, they're, almost, they're almost solving it every single time. Uh, now, you may say, well, this is because the chimps can't make an inference at all. Kids are good at, at, at making an inference. They see the bucket. They infer there must be food in there. But if you put it in a competitive context, so what we did is we, get competi we compete with the chimp. This is done with a human. The human competes with the chimp, and then on a certain trial, the human reaches like this, trying to get at the food in the bucket, but they, their hand is going through a hole in a plexiglass and they can't get it. They're trying to compete, and now the chimp gets his turn. Now they know where it is. Okay? So what they're doing is, in a competitive context, they're making the inference, he wants to get in that bucket. There must be something good in there. Okay? They can make that inference. By the way, your dog can make that inference also. Okay? He's trying to get in that bucket. There must be something good in there. But what they can't get is the communicative uh, inference and the communicative inference has the following structure he wants me he intends for me to know that the food is there or he intends for me to pay attention to there so basically you can gloss this as um, uh, the child understands that he intends for me to know that there is a banana in the bucket okay and I'm gonna I'm gonna skip those okay um, so the more cognitive side of human collaboration, uniquely human collaboration, is this structure of joint agency, this dual level structure, and it structures us having a joint goal with a joint commitment uh, to which we both um, are normatively committed to pursue, and it structures our individual roles and our individual perspectives such that we are able to take the perspective of the other to understand the role of the other uh, and so this is a um, um, uniquely human cognitive adaptations for collaboration so humans are uniquely adapted for collaborating with others in this way now the second step on to culture which I said I'm not gonna I mean I'm not don't <laughs> I'm not gonna talk about that uh, at length but I am gonna just show you two quick videos here of what happens at around three years of age when children start getting a little um, understanding about culture and how culture works and this is the following children are, of course grow up in the presence of social norms their whole lives the adults are telling them do this don't do this you know all kinds of things but our contention is that one-year-olds don't really understand those as social norms. One-year-olds and two-year-olds understand them as mom is telling me what to do as an individual. They're understanding it in this second personal way. They're understanding it as coming from one person to another. They conform to the norms. They learn the norms. But here is a key behavior. A key behavior is at around three years of age, they start enforcing norms on others. So this is the famous third-party punishment that Rob and others have uh, uh, touted as so critically important in the evolution of human cooperation in large groups, which is culture and later on in evolution. So here's what you see three-year-olds doing. What has happened here is that uh, this guy here has demonstrated a game called dacking. Dacking is a made-up word. Uh, and this child saw how to play the game. And then the puppet comes in and plays the game the wrong way. So now this is key. It's third party because the child is not affected at all. This is a game, a, this is a game an individual game. It's not like it's ruining the game for the child. The child's just watching. So this is a, as a disinterested spectator. And you'll see what the child does when, he plays the when the puppet plays the game the wrong way. No, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't go like that. No. No, not, it doesn't work like that at all. No, it doesn't work like that. No. Now he's going to teach. You have to take this. You have to take this, and here you do it like this. And now he's telling him how to, showing him how to do it. Okay. So from a third-party perspective, no negative consequences on him. The kids are enforcing the norm. And I know what they're saying there. They're saying, these are little German kids. That's what, that's what they're saying. Okay? I understand that. Okay? Uh, we, are, we are doing some cross-cultural things now. It's true that German children love their little rules. But still, okay? uh, this has been replicated in America for sure. We're now replicating it in other, uh, in other uh, cultural settings. Um, and so, um, uh, but... Um, I'll show you one, show you one more here. Uh, this one is a little more explicit. This is a five-year-old also. 
we taught them a little game here. And again, the child's watching the puppet play the game. And the puppet's playing it by the wrong rules. And <laughs> she's instructed not to pay attention so she's, she's not engaging <laughs> okay. <laughs> again the child is only an observer so this third party Intervention. We, ha we also have studies where it's a moral thing. The other guy is getting ready to tear up the picture of somebody else or whatever. They intervene in moral transgressions. They intervene in breaking the rules. So now, just following the rules is one thing. Following the rules is being prudent. It's, it's fitting in with the group. It's not getting punished. It's uh, conforming is, is, a good th is a smart thing to do. This is about enforcing. And it's kind of hard to generate what is motivating the children here. If you try to think in an evolutionary context of selfishness, what's the child getting out of it, it's a little bit hard to figure out what they're getting out of it unless you think of some kind of notion of group concern, orderliness, things should go the way they go because that's good for everybody and the way things go. Some kind of a group-minded concern uh, does this. So children start to, uh, we would say, uh, by the way, this is the age at which children actually start beginning to understand that linguistic uh, conventions are indeed conventions, that there are other ways of saying things and doing things. They have learned some language before, but they haven't understood it as conventions that could, be, could have been done a different way. If you ask a three-year-old, um, you know, if years ago, you know, we had, somebody had decided to call this an elephant, you know, could we have done that? You know, no, you know, you couldn't have. Well, why not? Well, because it's a pen. You know, so they, they think of it as the, the, the word as part of it. Okay, uh, and by the way, um, uh, so we never tested chimps on, on that, but we did test chimps on third-party punishment. That is, do chimps intervene? So if somebody steals something from me and I'm a chimp, I retaliate. That's well established by many people. But if I watch you stealing something from him, do I intervene? And the answer is no. Keith Jensen's study shows no third-party punishment um, in chimpanzees. Now, negative results, you, somebody else may find intervention in some case. There are no experimental demonstrations of third-party intervention. There are some of these policing things in natural groups uh, that probably have other motivations, but in any case, there are no experimental demonstrations that uh, hold everything constant. A second part of social norms that's key for young children and that we have found to be different with apes, because again, we're going to say chimps know, is worrying about your reputation. We worry about our reputations all day, every day. Children about five years of age, we set up a situation where this child needs a big sticker to finish her little thing here. And this is supposedly another child is coming in later. And these are for her. And she has more big stickers than she needs. <laughs> okay? so, uh, uh, and so now the question is, will she take, borrow, steal one of these big stickers? And the manipulation is, is she alone in the room or does she have somebody watching her? The little girl watching her, we have earphones on because if you don't put earphones in, they, they tend to talk and tell the other one what to do. If they have earphones on, they don't. So she's just sitting there not talking. And now you'll see this little girl who needs one of the big stickers. She starts to, but no, nope, she doesn't take it. <laughs> okay, she knows she's being watched, okay? So we actually have also the situation where she could share a sticker. This other little girl doesn't have one. And so as you can imagine, if you're being watched, you share more, you steal less. Chimpanzees don't care, okay? Now they may, you know, they do their big dis dominance displays. They may do something where they want the others to think they're dominant and stuff. But when the issue is cooperation, stealing and sharing, they don't care who's watching. So they're not, care, they're not worried about their cooperative reputation. So social norms uh, are playing a role. Uh, to, to have the kind of social norms that we humans have, you have to do, engage in third-party punishment, and you have to care when other people are gossiping behind your back and saying bad things about you. You have to care about that. You have to care about your reputation, and you have to enforce norms third-party. So um, 
I'm going to skip those. Uh, th th those were basically uh, advertisements for my new books, but I'll, I'll skip them now because I don't have time. That's less important. These kinds of things, I should say, we are just now starting to really engage in um, the kind of cross-cultural research that, pe other, that people have been encouraging us to do for a while to say these aren't just little German kids or little American kids, but this is going to be more general. So uh, this was one study we did. Now, this is important. These were the th one-year-old things. These were the basic skills that get you into a culture. So being able to imitate others, being able to understand others' intentions, following their gaze direction, pointing for them, collaborating with them in a simple task and engaging in joint attention with them. And all these dashes mean the ages of emergence were the same, were identical. These are two um, uh, rural, non-literate cultures, in, one in India and one in Peru, uh, your typical small-scale cultures, uh, which have a lot of uh, collaborative things going on. And in these one-year-old things, these are things that emerge in Western children between one and two years of age, one, a year and 18 months uh, uh, most often, uh, and they're the same everywhere. And they have to be the same everywhere because if you don't do these things, you'll be diagnosed with autism or something like that. Okay? These are not, the, you have to be able to do these kinds of things to participate in human culture. So these are prerequisites and these are universal in my opinion. I mean, we're jumping, it's a large jump from three cultures to universal, but I would hypothesize that they're all universal. But now, when we get to later things, when we get to social norms, when we get to cooperation and sharing the spoils and sharing fairly and that kind of stuff, now we have cultural differences. So these are things, I divide the world into one-year-old things and three-year-old things. These are three to five-year-old things. Three to five-year-old children are being really massively affected by the practices in their culture, by the norms in their culture. So uh, we have a, already a couple of published studies showing cultural differences in notions of fairness and what's fair in dividing the spoils. So I'm going to just emphasize that this is the basic stuff is universal and then the more derived stuff um, is going to be different uh, in different cultures. Um, another key um, so um, to, to this universality, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, people, if you're not from the behavioral scientists, uh, our natural science friends, will often say, oh, but this behavior stuff, it's so, you can't really touch it. It's not, well, we actually have a physical characteristic of humans that is po potentially, by one hypothesis anyway, uh, related to their cooperativeness. And this is over 200 species of non-human primates, all of them have very little of this white sclera around the eye. They have white sclera around the eye. If they look to the side, you can see it. But if they look straight ahead, you can almost not see it. Some species you can see a little bit. Uh, Carl's orangutans, you can see a little bit of it. Uh, but if they look straight ahead, you can, you can hardly see any at all. Over 200 species is all the same. Humans have this. What is that all about? And not only that, there's almost no variability in humans. You cannot find, like, people with almost no white sclera. You can't find a syndrome of, a genetic syndrome of people without white sclera. They, it, it almost doesn't exist. So there's almost no variability in the population. That means very strong selective pressure. Um, and what we did in our study was simply, um, the hypothesis is that this has something to do with cooperation. That is, if you are competing with other people, you don't want them to know where you're looking. We're, finding, we're going for food. I don't want you to know where I'm looking. And we're, I, I see a predator coming. I don't want you to see him because I want to run first and so he can catch you. All right, so uh, if we're competing, I want to keep it private. Uh, if you ever watch professional poker players on television, <laughs> they wear sunglasses so the other guy can't see where they're looking. So, so uh, uh, what humans are doing is advertising their gaze direction. They're advertising where they're looking. And we would argue that this could only emerge in a cooperative context where we're doing stuff together. Joint attention, it's important. I want you to know where I'm looking so you can coordinate with me. Human communication, cooperative communication has the same structure. I tell you what I'm thinking because I want you to know what I'm thinking because we're going to be working together. I'm advertising what I'm thinking. I'm advertising where I'm looking. That can only happen in a cooperative context. It can't happen in a competitive context. So this might actually be a morphological marker that would indicate at least a period when cooperation became even more important in human evolution. Our little experiment here was just to show that it does have a function in gaze following. One person actually had proposed it advertises your health because when you have sick looking whites of the eyes you look sick or something. But what we showed was that we had a two by two design so you either looked up or you looked straight ahead and you either had your eyes open or your eyes closed. And so the key conditions are chimps follow the head 
So if you close your eyes and look up, chimps look up. If you look up with your eyes only, they don't. Kids, you look up with your, close your eyes and look up, they don't look up. Look up with your eyes only, they look up. So chimps follow the head, kids follow the eyes. You can't jump from a current function to an evolutionary set of uh, conditions, but it at least shows that the whites of the eyes uh, may be serving the function, or at least one of its functions being to facilitate gaze following. Okay, so that's the end. Uh, human children, I have a very simple message for you that human children are adapted for cooperation, collaboration in ways that other great apes are not, and that these adaptations are fundamental to uniquely human processes of cognition, communication, culture, and morality. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mike. This is not. So I said thank, thank you very much. It's not working anyway. Yes. Uh, okay, now it's, it's time for questions. Um, actually, we have a few minutes to ask questions if we are interested in digging right over there. Me, me comentan que se pueden hacer las preguntas en español. ¿Quién, quién está, quién está? experiment with chimpanzees and humans where they work together for, for a goal, um, do they have experience with each other before the experiment? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. that's, that's actually the, the mama. <laughs> that's actually their caretaker, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And another question that I had was um, they've shown experiments where dogs uh, take decisions depending on if their owner has their eyes opened or closed, um, knowing that yeah. if the human, if their owner has their eyes closed, then mm -hmm. it's okay to take the treat because the owner's not looking. But if he has his eyes open, then yeah. he's worried because he might say something mean. Yeah. Um, does the does the eyes have a function uh, functionality with other species, not yeah, just humans? Yeah, so with chimps, they've done a somewhat similar experiment and, um, and with the same result. that They know if your back is turned, they can steal the thing, and if your back's not turned, they can. They're not so great with looking ahead and just closing your eyes. In fact, dogs are, I, I mean, they've never been compared directly, but dogs are probably a little bit better with the eyes only. Uh, but chimps definitely know whether you're looking or not. We've done some experiments like that in other people as well. So, um, uh, that's quite widespread, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you so much. I'm totally profane, actually. But I'm worried about more about dynamics in the sense that human-animal interaction probably is changing socially right away. So you work with primates which have been totally segregated from interaction with humans. Now that dogs have come up and sorted out like cats maybe, the question is to which extent have you thought about undergoing those experiments when humans are there? I've understood not only the eye question, but for example in France, the Baal, et cetera, have proven that literally equity and fairness are almost the same when the administrator is a human interacting with two even vervets or some other monkeys, not necessarily great apes. So the question is, okay, what about the fact that it's simply isolation 
species isolation, what might have caused, and then what we could call sentience or cognitive sentient capacity might change concerning companion animals, maybe also farm animals, etc. Do you have any idea about what that process might imply, and why is it that yeah. cognitive <clears throat> intelligent people have all and only focused on, on chimps? Why the natural and intuitive thing is that animals that interact with humans supposedly are like humans that interact with humans. It's like, um, the, I mean, when you take kids that don't interact, wolf, kid, etc., they don't seem to have, we don't have that experiment, we have only Rudyard Kipling's, you know, but yeah. can you perhaps share a little yeah. bit about this, yeah. about this well, idea? And, uh, the, the chimpanzees that live in different environments are, are different in some ways, the ones in the wild, they're ones in, uh, in our setting, they're in a zoo setting, they're in a very large area, they grow up in a social group, just like in the wild, it's a smaller area, but they're not impoverished socially at all, they're not impoverished from a cognitive point of view, they have tool use things, we have artificial termite mounds, artificial fishing things, um, and uh, I would say in terms of social dynamics, of course it's very different. Uh, in terms of foraging space, of large space, of course it's different. But the kind of things that we look at, um, um, we think are not uh, affected in major ways by that kind of rearing history. We could be wrong. There have not been experiments that actually compare them. One of the reasons is that you, in the wild you can't get the kind of control that you need. We want this animal to wait here until this one does something or whatever. You, you just can't get the control. So it's an open question. I have colleagues who have the point of view that the animals in captivity are not um, uh, the real thing. They're not the wild animals and so we shouldn't uh, um, make too much of it. Uh, but Hans Kummer, the famous Hans Kummer of Mr. Primatology in Europe for many years, uh, actually made an argument that went in the opposite direction, which is that in their natural environment they're already naturally adapted to do all these things easily and you put them in captivity where they're faced with problems sometimes especially in our experiments they've never faced before they develop cognitive skills that they don't develop in the wild a good example is tool use so gorillas and bonobos do not use tools in the wild and only some populations of orangutans and in captivity they're great tool users so if we only had natural observations in the wild we wouldn't know that they were great tool users we, we put them in novel situations so um, it's an open question. We don't, we don't know. And I'm just giving you my opinion that um, it depends on what you're looking at. If you're looking at certain kinds of things, uh, captivity makes a big difference to, in the wild. If you're looking at very basic things, uh, if you were looking at color perception, it wouldn't matter whether they grew up in the wild or captivity or wherever. So is it more like color perception or is it more like you know, some kind of um, uh, subtle uh, social thing that would obviously be very different in the wild? Uh, my question was rather a different point of view. What if they interact in a domestic setting? Well, we have, we have that. With, with, with dogs, I mean, which is... We, ha we, we have that. So we have chimps who have been raised by humans, several of them. No, we have uh, the Hayes and Hayes, Gardner and Gardner, whatever, uh, and, and that. And what we know is that they end up doing some things that... Uh, other chimps don't do, obviously, because they're presented with this new situation, but they don't turn into humans, and they have not been tested on all the sort of tests that I have up here. They haven't been tested on all, all those, so we don't really know um, how they would uh, perform in those. So, yeah. And Very interesting yes, talk. I like it very much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Just a very simple question. Do you think that the cooperation remains constant or more or less constant until all age? And the second one is, <laughs> uh, do you think this cooperation is disrupted or could be disrupted by Alzheimer's disease, for instance? I wouldn't know anything about old age myself, but uh, <coughs> uh, <laughs> but projecting, <laughs> um, uh, I have no I, I have no idea. I, I really don't. I, I, they haven't. Uh, it hasn't been. Uh, 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 older people have been tested in all kinds of cognitive paradigms. I don't know of any studies of cooperation. I don't. Uh, I could imagine. I could certainly imagine less, but I don't know for sure. Sorry. Please have a guess. <laughs> okay. Uh, my, my guess, uh, I, 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 I'm not even sure I could guess. I'm just thinking, uh, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, one thing that does seem to happen with old people that I've, uh, uh, that I've, I've heard, again, I'm not an expert in this, is they care less about their reputations. They, they, they don't care what people think anymore. I've heard people say it's liberal. The, the young people out here are on the Facebook and worried about what people are saying about them. The old people don't care. You know, right? That's okay. So, uh, and I think there is some data on that, but, uh, but not, uh, uh, yeah. Hey, thanks for the talk and for this huge amount of work, wonderful work. You made, mentioned a couple of topics that relate with the big topic of the evolution of cooperation. You've, you've referred to third party punishment, to reputation, these notions that are important for the, in, in theories of the evolution of cooperation and maybe of the evolution of morality. But for all you've said, um, it may just happen that uh, we evolved uh, with a motivation to cooperate, but for just for um, selfish uh, interests. Um, according to these yeah. theories, yeah. Co cooperation may be just the, a, a nice arrangement yeah, to advance our own interests. I understand. But for the evolution of morality, it seems that we also want some sort of other concern, or yes. concern for other interests. Yes. I would like to know whether you think that there is evidence I in support for this for the evolution of this uh, goodwill or this uh -huh. uh, concern for the interests of others. Okay, I, I, ha I have a, a book coming out in about uh, two months on the evolution, which uh, will answer your question fully. But for the moment, I would say two things. Uh, one is uh, I call it the interdependence hypothesis. That what happens is the first step back with these collaborative foraging is that we're interdependent. I need you. Now, the logic, even if you take the fully uh, selfish logic, is that um, if, you're my, if you're the only person that will collaborate with me and you're in trouble, I need to help you because otherwise I'm going to be unsuccessful tomorrow. If you're the only person that will mate with me, if you're the only female in the group that will mate with me, I don't want to take all the food and leave you with none. Then I'm not going to pass my genes along. So the, the, there's this logic of interdependence. It's basically Hamilton's equation, and you substitute for the coefficient of relatedness. You, saw if you substitute a coefficient of uh, interdependence. How much do I depend on you? So when we become uh, interdependent, we start. Uh, the, the, the evolutionary selfish explanation is uh, I invest in you because you doing better means I do better. But I also believe that um, we go beyond that. And this is part of, the, of, of what I argue in the book, is that collaborating in these ways yields as a byproduct, as a cognitive byproduct, that I see you as an equal to me. We're working together. We both have to work together. We need one another. I could play your role. You could play my role. The standards for your role, if we're going to hunt antelopes, the person in role A has to do these three things. The person in role B has to do these three things. And it's completely impartial. It doesn't matter whether you're my mother, you're my friend, whoever it is, if we're going to collaborate successfully, we, you have to live up to those standards, I have to live up to these standards. And so this collaborative activity generates the notion of you're equal to me in some way. Now, notice this is not a moral motivation. I wish it wasn't true. I wish all you people weren't equal to me. I wish I was the only person in the world that mattered and I could have everything. It doesn't matter what I want. It's not a motivation. I can't help but understand that you are a person like me with needs and desires like me uh, and who in some sense deserves stuff as much as I do. You know, I really want it more, but in terms of deserving, it's, it's, it's equal. So I think it generates as a kind of a byproduct. So this is kind of a, a spandrel, if you will, this notion of equality. And this leads to what I call in, in the book, we over me morality. So I make a joint commitment with you because I'm interdependent with you. I see you as an equally deserving partner. And so we work toward this outcome where we both are, get what we both deserve, which is an equal share of the, of the stuff. So I'm concerned about the we. I'm concerned about me, but I'm also concerned about we. And so I think that human morality really begins with a we and the concern for we. Hmm? I also, I should say the kind of Rousseauian move there also is that um, the we, I'm a part of the we. <laughs> so the we over me is not they over me. It's not you over me. It's not they over me. It's we over me. And I'm a part of the we and I'm in the me. So it's the kind of Rousseauian, it makes it legitimate. I agreed to this. I think it's a good idea that we have these social norms. And therefore, I subject myself to them. So it's a kind of a cognitive spandrel that leads to the moral uh, conclusion. Hello. Here. 
Um, where where uh, are here. we here? Okay, sorry. Uh -huh. um, my question was related to the one that uh, she asked before about the age and cooperativeness. Uh, maybe you said it before and I didn't get it. Uh, what age were the chimpanzees uh, that were compared well, to... Well, th this is a limitation of some, of some of the research. The chimpanzees were mainly juvenile adolescents and some adults. Um, and uh, you saw a couple of the little ones there, so that was just, uh, that's a lucky th thing that we could work with some of the young ones, but they're kind of all kind of ages, and um, more, in most of the experiments, they are adult-like, they're juvenile or uh, adolescent, and the kids are kids, so um, we don't have enough developmental data on chimps. We have two large-scale studies where we have young chimps, but um, uh, we didn't do all the tests on them, so... And do you think that maybe uh, when they get to sexual maturity, this could be interfering in their ability to cooperate or their uh, th willingness that, that to cooperate? It, it, it's possible, but we do the, the, the few studies we do have, you saw the, the little one there, and, and uh, we don't see any difference. Uh, but, but it's not been systematic and it hasn't covered all the studies for sure. But that, that's an interesting possibility. So one of the things with kids, well, our hypothesis about human children is that they're kind of indiscriminate cooperators, indiscriminate um, altruists until about three years of age. So if you look at these little kids, these one-year-olds and two-year-olds, and they're helping, you know, you know they're, they're not thinking about how much effort they're putting, they're not doing it, you know, they're just helping and whatever. And then when they get to be about three or so, that's weaning age in the normal uh, classic, you know, evolutionary environment. That's weaning age. They're on their own now. Now they start worrying about being lied to, being taken advantage of, and they're more selective in their cooperation. So I would say that in some sense, humans, in some sense, they become more cooperative because they're more capable of doing more things. But in other ways, they're being more selective in their cooperation, whereas the kids, they just don't know any better, and they're just being indiscriminately cooperative. So it's conceivable. Your hypothesis is conceivable that the, that the chimps could be more cooperative at younger ages. The little evidence we have doesn't support that, but we don't really have a lot of evidence. Thank you. It is true that almost all of our studies, uh, the best subjects, the ones who, are, who do the best for us, are the uh, juvenile chimps rather than the old age ones, I'm sorry to say. <coughs> okay. Yeah. Here. Uh, my question is about the roots, the beginning of cooperation in human beings. Uh, early on in life, there is cooperation asymmetrical. The adult needs the child to do some things in order to be able to feed or... Yeah. What do you make of this asymmetrical cooperation and how important will be the longitudinal study of this uh, cooperation before the symmetrical yeah. between equals? Uh, so Piaget has, a, has always... Um, talked about the two social worlds of childhood. The world of interacting with adults, where adults are more knowledgeable and powerful than you, and interaction with peers on an equal plane. And in moral development, he proposes that you get, you develop moral, deve moral development occurs as a result of interaction with peers. Because following adult rules is not being moral, it's just following rules. And it's peer interaction that matters. And I think this notion of coming to see your partner as an equal and as an equally deserving partner happens with peers. It doesn't happen with adults because adults are too powerful and, and you defer to adults and adults help you and you rely on adults. So I think that's an interesting um, uh, uh, idea that has not been pursued in developmental psychology to the degree that it could be. We've done a couple of things, we're doing a couple of things now, but um, I think the interaction with adults, this asymmetrical interaction as you call it, um, uh, leads to one set of things and is critical and important like for passing along cultural knowledge and learning skills and stuff, you have to have that, but this symmetrical um, uh, interaction with peers uh, has um, uh, some other advantages and develop some other things, um, uh, uh, and especially in the moral domain. Um, hello. <laughs> My question refers to the uh, cross-cultural study. Um, put the mic a little bit closer, just put it more closer to your mouth, that's okay. all. Okay. The cross-cultural study, and it's partly a request for further information, and if I remember correctly, there were differences between India and Canada. Yes in uh, yes. the emergency of pointing yes. and the collaboration in the yes. opposite direction. Yes, it was a few months in either direction, uh -huh. yes. If I am correct, it, it, became, it, it came later in India, the pointing came later in India, but the collaboration came earlier, is that right? Uh, I, I believe I so. so, that sounds right. <laughs> no, my question refers... Um, the pointing is earlier in India uh -huh. and the collaboration is earlier in China, Canada uh -huh. by a few months each. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, 
is that related, I don't know how you uh, assess that, is that related to the possibility of having a more uh, proximal interactions between mothers and children in India in relation to Canada? That's uh, one thing. And the other thing, do you think that proximity in the interaction, if that is right, also facilitates collaboration? And the third question is how you assess joint attention because usually one of the standard ways of assessing joint attention is the comprehension and production of pointing. Yeah. So just uh, okay. Uh, can I remember these? Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, let, let me let me let me let me let me try my hand here. Okay. So the the third. Let me I go backwards. That'll help. Okay. So the third one. Uh, we assess joint attention in a very simple way. It was simply the looking back and forth like this. That's not the best way, but it's just the um, alternating gaze uh, and with some kind of uh, sharing type smile or emotion or something like that. So very uh, straightforward um, way. Um, uh, and then uh, help me out here. What the whether, whether there wasn't, do you think it's, uh, uh, th there can be any relationship between um, uh, right. the experience of proximal rather than distal jo um, joint at attention experiences or interactions between mother and child? Yeah. We, we didn't have the kind of ethnographies that we would need to have to, to know that. I, I, I just don't know the answer to that. But it's possible, but I don't know. And you had one, and the one more? Relationship. Well, sorry, whether there was a relationship between um, well, those proximal interactions yeah. or there could be. Could you speculate on that? Yeah, uh, there could and be. An but earlier emergence of collaboration. Uh, okay, well, one, one interesting thing that I think is possible, and this is totally, totally speculative and comes back to your question, is that one of the things, like you see here, collaboration um, in the Indian, in, in the Canadian sample, one of the big differences between Western cultures, so-called weird cultures, uh, Western educated, industrial, rich, democratic countries and more traditional cultures is that the, in the weird cultures the adults get down on the floor and play with kids and communicate with them whatever. In a lot of the more traditional cultures the adults take care of the kids but they don't get down and do it on the equal level. Maybe the Canadian mothers getting down on the floor collaborating with their kids um, uh, leads to these collaborative skills where these other kids are waiting for their peer interactions to really collaborate. But I, I really, I don't, I'm sorry but I don't know the answer to that. Hello, here, Mike. Okay. <laughs> hi, thanks for the nice oh, hi. talk. Hello. Hi. Uh, my question is about the evolutionary scenario in which you think that cooperation evolved. At the beginning, you talked about hunting, you mentioned gathering also, mm -hmm. but if you look at small scale societies, often you see that gathering is quite individual. Maybe people yeah. go together, yeah. but they are gathering individually. So is it hunting, really, the thing, or maybe mother yeah, I've, 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 I've had this from Sarah Hurdy and uh, Kirsten Hawks uh, previously. Uh, so there are two things. One is modern hunter-gatherers are not a great model because they have weapons that enable, and tools that enable you to do it by yourself. So the proposal is that at an earlier stage, they didn't have the technology to do these things together. That's one thing. Uh, the other thing is... Um, Sometimes you can do something where you could do it by yourself, but it's better collaboratively. The gathering tubers that you saw with the women digging, you can do that by yourself. But, it's, but what they do is one of them watches the kids and keeps an eye out for any whatever, predators, and the other one dig, and the other two dig, and it helps if two of you are digging from different sides. So um, uh, uh, some of the gather gathering honey often, uh, uh, I, I guess, is often a male activity, but still uh, requires collaboration um, uh, as well. So... It could be hunting. There are a lot of stories. I know that, again, the people who want to tell a more feminist version uh, of, of human evolution hate the man, the hunter story. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, meat was very important in, in the supplying the kind of protein that allows us to have a brain three times the size of other apes. And meat is, was very important uh, in, uh, in, in human evolution. So I think, I think it was part of it. Another thing that Kirsten Hawks and uh, Sarah Hurdy uh, uh, press on, and this I don't know, and Carl I think is going to, you know, you'll talk about it in, in, in Berlin, but not here, is uh, um, cooperative breeding. And so uh, I think a lot of uh, uh, cooperative child care uh, is a key part. So again, you've got one of them watching the kids while the other one works. Sometimes you, um, the women get together and one of them watches the kids while the others go forage, and it's much more efficient to, to do it that way. So it could be that the gathering, the collaboration and gathering was both uh, for actually gathering stuff, but also um, uh, in the childcare as part of the collaborative activity, which means we have to come back and 
bring some of it back for the babysitter, okay? It's only going to work if the babysitter gets her share. So it has this collaborative um, uh, sharing of the spoils component as well. So um, 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 the story is about collaborative foraging. I don't know the details about the male and female roles in that, but I think both, um, uh, uh, I, I assume it's both. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. We have to stop here. We will have a break for a coffee. Um, but don't feel frustrated because tomorrow we will have a session where we can bring all the questions that we cannot ask now. Thanks. <laughs>